Well, amen. I hope uh, all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. As Neil reminded us, uh, we have every reason to give thanks. Um, despite our, any kind of circumstances that we might be in, we have great reason to give thanks because of what Jesus Christ has done. And uh, uh, next week, we're going to begin our Advent series, and so I hope that you will join us for that. I hope you'll invite uh, a friend to join you as well. We've got Christmas Eve coming up as well, and so getting ready for the holiday season, and it's going to be a, a great time as a church family as we celebrate Advent together. But this morning, we're going we're gonna to conclude uh, this section that we've been looking at in the, the mission of the church. Uh, we're going to come to our third sermon on the mission of the church. And the first week we saw uh, that the church's mission is to glorify God. And if you missed that sermon, I just encourage you to go back and, and check that out. That we looked at this idea that our, our purpose, our mission as a church is to bring glory to God. That's why we exist as a church. Last week we looked at the idea that our mission as a church is to make disciples it's to reach people with the gospel. It's to share the good news. It's not just to be a, a holy huddle of people that gather together, but we are to go and to share and to tell the good news of the gospel. And, and Neil did a great job uh, teaching from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Just a reminder there, Jesus came and said to them, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the ends of the age. This is the commission that God has given his church. This is our job description. This is our calling. This is what the Lord has entrusted us to do. And as we read that great commission, in the very beginning, we see that its, its focus is on evangelism, right? It's on going and sharing the message and, and so that people can be baptized into the faith and that they can know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then the second part of that commission then moves on to this idea of teaching them all that I have commanded you. And this is the process of, of making disciples. And it's this, this second element of, of teaching and maturing that I want to bring us to this morning as we come to this third part of the church's mission. And the mission of the church is not only to glorify God, not only to reach people and make disciples, but it is edification. The church's mission is edification. Now, that's a big word <laughs> and not a word that people use all the time and not a word that everybody understands what it means. If you are new to Christianity, if you're new in, in church, uh, that might be a word you've never heard before, edification. You might not have any un understanding of what that word means and I want to help you understand it this morning. Or maybe you've been in the church for a very, very long time and you still have no clue what that word means because we use all kinds of words at times and sometimes we have no idea what those words mean. And so this morning I want to dig into what does this mean? What does edification mean? And where do we see it being a mission of the church? And then how do we actually edify one another? And so what is edification? Well, the word edify or edification that you might find in your New Testament, uh, in your English, uh, comes from a Greek word, uh, oikodomeo. It's a compound word, and uh, the first part of the word is oikos, which is house, and the, the second part of the word is, is the verb domeo, which means to build. And so literally, the word means to build a house. So what does that have to do with our mission as a church? And, and how does it get to this idea of, of, of spiritual growth? Well, the word is used literally a number of times in the New Testament for literal buildings. It's used for the temple. Uh, it's used for the synagogue. It's used for a tower. Uh, and it, it, it's used for a literal building. But it's also used in a figurative sense that believers are being built up into something. 
And that's the way that Paul uses this word a number of times when we find it in the New Testament. We either find it as edify or edification or building up or built up, uh, depending on what translations you use. And it's this idea that we as believers are being built up into something. Now, we saw earlier in our study of, of, the new, of, of the church that one of the metaphors that is used to describe who we are as a church is a temple, a new temple and a, or a new building, Paul uses in 1 Corinthians. And Peter uses this idea in 1 Peter 2.5. He says, you yourselves, you, speaking to the church, you are like living stones, and you are being built up as a spiritual house or a temple to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You as the church, you are a spiritual house that is being built up by God, Peter says. Well, this idea comes from Jesus' own words in Matthew 16, 18 that we looked at when we looked at the promise of the church, when Jesus initially says, I am going to build my church, and he uses the same word in Matthew 16, 18. He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word that Jesus uses here is the same word, this compound word, okonomeo, which means I will build up, I will build my house. So it makes perfect sense that Paul would then use this word and other New Testament writers would use this word and this concept as, as one of the primary missions of the church, that we are to build one another up to something, that we are to be being built up into something. So where do we then see this idea of edification being about the mission of the church? Well, there are a number of passages that we could look at this morning that would point us to this idea that the church has a purpose and a mission to edify one another, to build one another up. But one of the primary passages I want to look at is found in Ephesians chapter 4 in 11 through 16. We're going to have it on the screen, but you can turn there if you want in your Bibles because we're going to look at that passage for a little bit this, together this morning, and then we'll look at a couple other passages. But that's kind of our primary text this morning. And Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 uh, if you know the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters of Ephesians are all doctrine. They're all who God is, and who we are, and who we are to be in Christ. They're all doctrinal. Uh, uh, it's, it's all doctrine. It's rich, heavy, thick doctrine. And then when you come to chapter 4, there's a transition that Paul says, Now, therefore, based on everything that you know about God... Here's now how you are to live your lives. And he moves into, into three chapters of application. And it's in the beginning of these chapters of application that Paul explains who we are as the church, how God has gifted the church and what those gifts are for. And we pick up in verse 11 as he speaks of these gifts of grace. He says, and he gave the apostles and the prophets, and the evangelists, and the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up, there's that word, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ Christ 
from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. There's that word again. It builds itself up in love. Now there is a ton in this passage. And we do not have time to go through every bit uh, of text in this passage. But I want to highlight for you the, the focus, uh, which is uh, the, 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 its focus on edification. And I want to show you what Paul says about how the church is to be edified. Now, it starts in verse 11 when he, he starts explaining that these, these gifts have been given to the church for the purpose of edification. In verse 11, he says, and, and God gave the apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. God has given the church leaders and the leader's primary responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's, that's a leader's primary responsibility. It, yes, a leader does ministry. We do ministry all the time. There's no question about that. But the primary responsibility is to equip every believer to do ministry. You might not know it, but you are a minister of the gospel. If you are a Christian, God has equipped you for ministry gifted you for ministry, called you for ministry. And you have a primary responsibility, which is to use your gifts in the body of Christ to build up the body of Christ. And if you are not doing that, you are severely missing out on what God has designed you for. You are like a, a Ferrari that is, that is in the slow lane with the school zone. Right? You are not doing what you were designed for. Yes, you are driving, but you are not driving how you were designed. You need to be out on the open road the way God has designed you. Right, You need to be in the body of Christ, using your gifts, building up one another. That is what the church has been designed for. And you are a part of that design. You are not an attender. You are not just a person that comes to church. You are a part of the body of Christ. You are a living stone of this temple and you have a role and a purpose. And here Paul says that the, the leader's job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Why? Notice the reason. For building up the body of Christ. This is the purpose of ministry. The reason we have been gifted, the reason God has called us in this body is that we would build one another up in Christ. So what does it mean to build up the body of Christ? What does Paul mean by building up the body of Christ? Well, he goes on in the next verse to tell us what that means is that he wants us to become more like Christ. So to build up the body of Christ is to help people become more like Christ. To help us become more Christ-like. So in your community group, on Sunday morning, in your Bible studies, as you interact with people, as you are building them up, what you are doing is you are helping them become more like Christ. You see, God's design is not that we would just go home to our study and study as much as we can and try to become more Christ-like. God has designed this incredible ecosystem called the church. And as we interact as the church, as the body together, as we walk through challenges, as we allow the Spirit to lead us and guide us, as we, as we defer to one another, as we encourage one another, as we pray for one another, as we love one another, as we forgive one another, through that, as we teach one another, we grow up into Christ. Notice what he says next. He says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, there is an always an already but not yet aspect to Paul's teaching. As he teaches, and he goes back and forth. <laughs> And so sometimes it's really hard to pick up, but there's an, there's an already aspect. We are already something in Christ, but we are not yet what we are going to be. We are not yet what God has designed us to be. And here in this passage, he gives us this already not yet. He says, one day, one day we will all be glorified and we will fully attain unity of the faith. And we will fully attain the knowledge of the Son of God. And we will fully attain the stature of the fullness of Christ. That means we will grow up into the full maturity, into Christ-like image that God has designed us for. But you know what? <laughs> We're not there yet. I don't know about you, <laughs> but I'm not there yet. I still have a lot of growing to do. I still have a lot of maturing to do. I have a lot of sanctification that needs to take place in my life. And you know what? I'm not meant to do that alone. I'm meant to do that within the body of Christ. And within the body of Christ, we help one another grow into this Christ-like maturity. And so, so what does it mean to edify? What does it mean to build up one another? It means that we help one another grow in being more like Christ every day and in every way. We help one another grow more like Christ in our thinking, more like Christ in our feelings, and more like Christ in our conduct. That we help one another, that we encourage one another, that we admonish one another, that we challenge one another. And through the body, we help each other be built up into what Christ has designed us to be. Now, uh, he goes on here to say it means that, that we are growing in spiritual maturity, right? That's the illustration that Paul uses. The metaphor that he uses here is that spiritual growth is in spiritual maturity are synonyms for this idea of edification. That we are being grown up into spiritual maturity. Notice what he says there in verse uh, 14, so that, by, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Now, Paul mixes his metaphors here. <laughs> And that should be no surprise to us by now. If you've read any of Paul's literature, you know that, that he does that all the time. He starts with one metaphor, then he, all of a sudden he just switches to another metaphor and throws you all off. But he's, in both metaphors here have the same idea that you are being built up, that you are being matured, that you are, being, that you are growing up into something. He starts out with the, the first metaphor of a, of a building. And he talks about the fact that we are a building that is being built up. And, and uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a construction guy. Uh, there's other guys. There are many guys in here that are. And they could probably give you way better illustrations of this. But, but, but I did have the privilege of going down and building homes in Mexico. When I was a youth pastor, we went down almost every, every year down for spring break. And we would go down and we would build homes. And what was amazing about that is, uh, is that, in Mexico at least, you could go down and you could build a house in a week. Um, and we would go down with a group of people and there would be a, a dry piece of land, just a bare piece of land. And we would go down and as a team, we would work hard and we would take bricks and we would put bricks down and cement and then Walls would start to go up and then we'd plaster the walls and then we'd start putting a roof on. And, and by the end of that week, there was an actual house that somebody would live in, that they would care for their family, that they would you know, raise their children in. And it was the most incredible experience ever to, to go down and from nothing to all of a sudden seeing this house built up. And Paul is using this illustration that, that, you know, together we're just like this random brick out on the, out on the side. We're easily 
discarded. We're easily taken out. We're easily smashed. We're easily removed from these schemes and these wickedness and this human crafting and this doc, you know, false doctrine. But when we are built up together in Christ, when these bricks are laid down together and they're cemented together by the Holy Spirit, they become something together that they are not by themselves. And they become a building that is being built up. And the picture here is they are being built up into Christ, into Christ-likeness. You know, and, and, and every, every church plant is a reality of that, but God's eternal church is, part, is, is a picture of that as well. But I think of even our little church, right, that we started with just, you know, a handful of families that came together to encourage one another and to share the gospel and to be missionaries. And God, by his grace, just keeps building. He just keeps adding. And he keeps saying that we need this and we need this so that we can become what God has called us to be, to become conformed to the image of Christ because I need you and you need me. That's what the Lord is saying right now for us being a church together is that we need one another so that we can become more what God has called us to be, which is being conformed into the image of his son. And so he uses the, the metaphor of a building and then he moves on to the metaphor of a child and he says, like, 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 a, like a child, you are an infant growing up into an adult. And, you know, when a child does childlike things, right, as parents, we kind of laugh. We think it's kind of cute. You know, when your college kid does childlike things, it's not funny, right? Nobody's laughing. Like, no, 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 that's not cool. Yeah, eat your food, right? And because a, a child is a child, a, a, an adult is an adult. And Paul is saying, you are Meant to be adults, spiritual adults. You are meant to be grown up into Christ likeness. You are not to stay in your immaturity. You are not to stay in your sinful desires. You are not to stay in, in what you were before Christ. You are to become more like Christ in every way. And as he says that, he says, You need one another to do that, that we grow one another up in that. And so the goal of the church is to become more like Christ. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, right? That's what he says there. This is the goal of Paul's life, right? Everywhere you look, this is the goal of Paul's life. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This would be the, the statement I think every leader would desire to say, don't follow me and become like Phil. That would be a horrible mistake. Follow the Christ-like aspects, whatever Christ-like aspects you can find within whatever leader, follow that because that is worthy of following. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This was the goal of Paul's ministry. In Colossians 1.28, he says, him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This is the purpose of the church, the goal of all ministry. He says in 2 Corinthians 13.10 that this was the purpose of all of his authority, of all apostolic authority and teaching. He says, for this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me. Why? For building up and not for tearing down. It's the same word, okodameo there. That, that, that for building up, uh, this is why he has been given apostolic authority. And this was the command that Paul gave over and over and over to the church that we are to build one another up, that we are to edify one another, that we are to help one another become more Christ-like in every way. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Paul says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. In Romans 14, 9, Paul says, So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, as he speaks to how we are to use our gifts in the body of Christ, he says, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one is a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So edification 
is helping one another grow and mature more into the image and the likeness of Christ. And it is God's mission for his church. It is God's mission for you as his church. If you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are part of God's church, this is God's purpose and mission for you, or one of them. It is that you would edify the rest of the body, that you would help build them up into more Christ-like image. So then how, the last thing, then how then do we help edify the church? How practically can we help edify one another? If this is what we're called to, if this is what the church's mission is, then how do we do it? Well, there are a number of ways that, that we could focus on. I mean, we could preach sermon after sermon of how we are to edify one another, but we don't have time for that. So we're going to focus in on three specific ways that I, that I think we can help one another grow into Christ-like uh, uh, maturity and Christ-like image. And the first is this. We can help one another be more Christ-like in our thinking. We can help one another become more Christ-like in our thinking. Part of edification means that we begin to think more like Christ. That is not our natural inclination. Our natural inclination is to think like by our flesh and by ourself and by the world around us that just pumps and pours worldview into our minds every day. As we turn on the TV, as we go to work, as we interact with friends, as we go to school, the, the world just pours into our minds how we are to think. How we are to think of God, how we are to think of ourselves, how we are to think of money, how we are to think of relationships, how we are to think of pleasure. The world pours into our minds how we are to think. The church is meant to pour into one another's hearts how God thinks that we would think more Christ-like in every way, that we would encourage each other, confront each other, admonish one another, that when we begin to stray away from Christ-like thinking, that we would rebuke that and draw each other back, that when we're talking about an idea or a thought, we would encourage one another in Christ-like thinking, and that all of this would happen through the word of God, which is God's mind revealed to us, is it not? In Romans 12, 2, which we looked at a number of weeks ago, it reminds us that we are to be transformed, that this is an act of worship for us, what we have been called to. He says, do not be conformed to this world, Christian, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. He says, you have God's word that has been given by his spirit. It is God's revealed absolute truth. And every idea, every thought, every worldview, you test by God's word to see, is it, is it his will? Is it what I'm supposed to be thinking? Is it what I'm supposed to be doing? And, and sometimes just by ourselves, we get confused or distracted. And so the body of Christ comes together. And as we all hold God's word in high value, we strengthen each other and encourage one another to test everything by God's word. When the church begins to move in a certain direction, it is the body of members that brings it back to God's word and says, no, God's word will be the authority of this church. We will not move from God's word. If the culture moves, the culture moves. It does not move God's word. It does not move the church. And we need one another to build each other up in that way. The primary tool, the most significant tool to help us edify one another in our thinking is God's word, right? Over and over again, we see that true in scripture in Acts 20, verse 32, Paul says to the Ephesian elders, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up or edify you and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
First Peter 2.2, 2, Peter says, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. And Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. How do we edify one another? We help one another grow in our thinking, that our thinking is more Christ-like, that our thinking is more word-centered, that the decisions we are making are based on God's truth and not just on our personal feelings. And so friends, how are you growing in God's word? How are you investing in God's word? How are you allowing for it to wash over you daily and, and strengthen you in all of your thinking? And how are you helping others in the body of Christ in that way? It's one thing to edify yourself. It's one thing to build yourself up, to spend time in your study by yourself with the Bible. It's a whole nother thing to be in a community of people that help grow one another through the difficult process of helping shape our thinking by God's word. You know, that's a primary purpose of community groups is to, is to do life together and to be shaped by God's word together. To take Sunday's message and God's word and talk about how do we actually apply it to our lives? How do we really dig into this and how do we live this out as followers of Jesus? This is what we have been called to how are, how are you taking every opportunity to be under the word of God, to be in the word of God, to be strengthening yourself by the word of God? And how are you taking opportunities to gather with other believers to discuss God's word and how it applies to your life? Are you letting God's word shape your mind and shape every part of your thinking? And how are you helping others do this as well? You know, it doesn't happen by accident. I mean, you will not grow in Christ-like thinking by accident or by just casual Sunday attendance. You must be in God's word continually. It's like everything else in life. It doesn't happen by happenstance or by mistake. You know, when I think about putting a sermon together, man, I wish I could just be like, eh, sermon, right? <laughs> It doesn't happen like that. It takes an incredible amount of study and work and, and, and time and effort and sweat and pouring into it, right? Because that's how God has designed our world. And the same is true of our spiritual growth. It will not happen by accident. It doesn't even happen just over time. Some people think, well, I've been a Christian for 50 years. That's great. Have you been in God's word for 50 years? Have you been studying God's word for 50 years? Then you are a valuable resource to the body of Christ. But I've met many 50, 60, 70 year olds that are infants in scripture. Age is not the issue. Maturity is the issue. And, and God desires for all of us, no matter our age, that we would be always growing in God's word. I love being around believers that have been believers for 50 years who are still, who are still you know, in a theology class asking questions and growing in God's truth. Even though they've been Christians for a long time, they realize that they never stop growing. That's how God has designed us. And so God desires for us to help one another and uh, be more like Christ-like in our thinking. We all, the second way that we can help edify one another is we can help one another be more Christ-like in our feelings. We can help one another be more Christ-like in our feelings. You see, God is not only interested in our heads, in our minds, in our thinking. He's also interested in our hearts, in our desires, in our feelings. Now, the goal of correct thinking we know from Scripture is not just that we would have more knowledge, but that we would be transformed by that knowledge. 
that it would affect our desires, that it would affect our, our drive, and, and that would then affect our actions and our obedience, and that the three would go together. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 about this, this idea of knowledge, he says, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge, but this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This is a warning for all of us that are uh, very uh, intellectual in, in different ways and, and, and Bible churches that are heavy in the Bible, right? That, that is a good thing. We need to be in God's word. That is important. But we must realize that, that it is not for just knowledge's sake. It is for the sake to make us more like Christ, which starts with our desires and moves into our conduct. In 1 Corinthians 13, 2, Paul issues another warning. He says, if I have prophetic powers, then understand all mysteries and all knowledge. If I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I have or I am nothing. Paul instructs and warns us this idea that if we, we can have all knowledge, but if that knowledge does not lead us to into more Christ-like behavior and into more Christ-like desire, that knowledge means nothing. And so we need to be in the word, but we need to allow that word to transform our hearts. That's what God is focused on. The, the greatest commandment that we've been given in scripture is focused on our desires, on our hearts. Matthew 22, 36 to 40, Jesus says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. For this is a great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. For on these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. You see, God desires for us not only to become more Christ-like in our thinking, but more Christ-like in our feelings, more Christ-like in our desires. He wants us to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Now, by God's word, we understand what that is, but it needs to transform our actual desires so that we actually do love what God loves and we actually do hate what God hates. James explains this idea that, that desire drives our behavior as he, as he talks about temptation in James 1, 14 to 15. He says this, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. You see, it is desire that leads us to temptation. It's desire that leads us to action. Every time that we sin, we are saying that I love this thing more than I love God, right? That's the reality. We can break it down into all kinds of other ways, but the reality is, as believers, every time we sin, we are saying, I love this, whatever it is, my anger, my lust, my greed. I love this, more than I love God in this moment. And so as we want to grow in Christ-like behavior, it starts by a transformation of the heart. It starts by a desire. It starts by, by loving God more than anything and everything. And as that love grows deeper and deeper, the things of this world become strangely dim to us. They become... Uh, they become what, what God hates, we begin to hate. And what God loves, we begin to love. And, and it comes through his word and by his spirit and through the body of Christ as it transforms us. This is what it means to become mature and Christ-like. This is what it means to be built up into Christ. The psalmist tells us that obedience begins with desire. In Psalm 119, 9 through 10, the psalmist says, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek after you. Let me not wander from your commandments. You see, God's design is not just that we would do the right thing. 
but that we would desire to do the right thing, that our hearts would long for God and desire to obey God and to desire to please him because of who he is and because of what he has done. You know, if you have children, you realize that the heart matters, right? If you tell your kids to do something and they do it, but they do it, you know, kicking and stomping and spitting and spewing and huffing and puffing, right? there, That doesn't bring joy to your heart. Yes, the room got clean, but the heart is totally absent from obedience. God's desire is not just that we would do the right thing, not that we would just try to be a morally pure person. Does God want us to be morally pure? Yes. Is that the goal? No. The goal is that our hearts would be transformed, that we would love purity and desire purity and desire God more than anything, that our lives would be pure because God's desire is for that and he has made us for that and that's what's best for our lives. Not because we want to check off a box or pretend like we're religious. God desires our hearts. And so, Paul, uh, so, so, so how are we helping one another grow in that Christ-like desire? That's what we need to ask. How do we help edify one another? We help edify one another by, by, by exemplifying a passion for the Lord, by, by encouraging a passion for, for the Lord, by, by lighting a fire of passion for the Lord and what he loves. So how are you helping others in the body learn to love what God loves and hate what God hates. You see, passion is contagious. And so, our, so, so by our lives, we are either helping or hurting others have a passion for the Lord. When people look at your lives, what do they see that you are passionate about? Is it money? Is it power? Is it a position at work? Is it a relationship? What do they actually see that you are passionate about in your life? Because as people see a, 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 a body of believers who are all passionate about Christ, then everybody who enters in becomes passionate about Christ as well. The DNA, the culture of the church infuses into others' lives and that's how God has designed it. And so what do we want to be passionate about? We want to be passionate about Christ. We want to exalt him, worship him, and lift him up. And so we help one another by becoming more Christ-like in our feelings. The last way, the third way that we help edify one another is we can help one another be more Christ-like in our conduct. We can help one another be more Christ-like in our conduct. And these three, these three things all go together, right? Christ-like thinking leads to Christ-like desires, and Christ-like desires lead to Christ-like conduct. And all three are required as we grow in spiritual maturity. Paul starts out chapter 4 of Ephesians with this encouragement to the church. He says this in verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Again, this comes after three chapters of doctrine based on who God is. Now, this is how you are to live your life. This is Christian maturity. And this, this happens best in the context of community. God has designed it that we would help one another grow in Christian maturity. That's what the one another's in scripture are all about. If you go through, you want, you want an exercise this week? Go through the New Testament and highlight every one another in scripture and you will see exactly how we are to edify one another in our conduct. The one another's in scripture are given to us that we would help one another grow in Christian maturity maturity. This is the purpose of each of our spiritual gifts, not to serve ourselves, but to build up the body of Christ. We are called to love one another, to live in harmony with one another, to care for one another, 
to admonish one another, to be kind to one another, to serve one another, to speak truth to one another, to forgive one another, to stir up one another to love and good deeds, to pray for one another, and to be humble towards one another. And there are many, many, many more that you can go discover on your own. And so we help, become, we help one another become more Christ-like in our conduct by celebrating and by modeling righteous and Christ-like behavior and by repenting of and admonishing unrighteous behavior. As a body, that's what we do. We celebrate righteous behavior. We celebrate godly behavior. We encourage godly behavior through the one another's and we admonish one another and we demonstrate through personal repentance when our behavior is not in alignment with God's word that, that we place ourselves back in alignment with God's word and by doing that together, we together help one another grow up into maturity into Jesus Christ by exemplifying the conduct that God has called us to live by. And so friends, how are you personally putting off unrighteousness and putting on righteousness in your life? How are you growing? Because if you are personally growing, then you are able to walk alongside others and help others grow. And then the second question is, how are you helping others do that? How are you helping others put on righteousness in their life and put off unrighteousness in their life? How seriously do you take sin in your life? And are you fighting it on your own? Are you trying to battle your sin on your own? Or are you inviting other believers into that battle with you? Are you telling them the areas of your life that you need help with? Are you saying, encourage me, pray for me, challenge me, admonish me, walk with me, care for me. I need you. You see, we live very individualistic lives. We live in a very individualistic culture. And so we think that the Christian life is meant for us to live on our own. And that is not how God has designed the Christian life. God has designed the Christian life that we would grow in Christ together. That we would encourage one another and challenge one another and build one another up into Christian maturity. And so edification is what the Lord has called us to as, as a church. And, and all of this just scratches the surface of how we can edify one another in the body. But I hope it gives you a great place to start. I hope it gives you things to think about and challenges you and says, okay, how am I using my gifts to edify others? How am I using my time to edify others? How is God using me in this body so that others are being built up more into the image of Christ? You see, the important thing to remember is that the goal is to help one another become more Christ-like in every way. That's our goal. Every time we gather together, every time, every word we speak to each other, every time we encourage one another or admonish one another, it is to help each other grow more into the image of Jesus Christ. And to remember that edification is more than an individual goal. It is a mission of God's church. God has designed our Christian growth to be formed through the community of a church. That's why the commands in Scripture are not to individuals. Go through and look at it yourself. These commands of edification are not given to individual Christians. They are given to the church as a whole because it is the church's responsibility as the body to help one another grow in Christ. So we need to be committed to much more than just our own growth. Yes, we need to grow individually, but we need to be committed to much more than just our own growth. We need to be committed to building up one another in the body of Christ. That's God's design. That's God's desire. That's the mission that God has given us as his church. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we need your help to fulfill any of what we've studied this morning. God, we need your spirit right now, Lord, to just dig into areas of our lives where each of us need to grow. We need you to tell us, Lord, Lord, 
how we are to use our gifts for your glory, how we are to use the time that you've given us and our investment in the body of Christ. Lord, we need you to to remind us and prioritize within us to be under the word of God and to be encouraging others in the word of God. Lord, I don't know where everybody's at in this room, but God, you do. Lord, there are those in this room perhaps that have yet to even enter into a relationship with you. And so for them, Lord, this morning, I pray that they would would hear the gospel, that they would know that you love them, that they would repent of their sin, they would trust in Jesus, that they would begin a relationship with you. Lord, there are those in this room that have walked with you for a long time, God, and, and they're they're sitting on the sidelines maybe, God, and, and, and doing a lot of personal study, but they're not discipling anyone. They're not involved in helping anyone else grow. Lord, I pray this morning that you would challenge them to take all that you've poured into their lives and, God, that they would then pour that into others' lives. Father, that we would take uh, people around us, Lord, and, and we would entrust to them what you have entrusted to us by your word and Father, that we would help each other grow more into the image of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, your spirit knows exactly what we need to hear, knows exactly how we need to grow. Father, would you, would you instruct us and teach us? And then, Lord, would you give us the strength to be able to obey? Would you motivate us by your love and by your grace and by your mercy? Would you change our desires, Lord, that we would desire to be more like Jesus in every way? in our thinking, in our feeling, in our conduct. God, we never want to stop until the race is over. We continually want to be growing more and more into the image of Jesus every day. And so, Lord, would you help us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.